All right, well, if you will, let us open our Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you can kind of just hold on there. We'll have a few verses we'll look at. But this morning, we're going to continue in our series called This is Church, How Does God Build a Body? So the first week, we laid out an initial definition of the church by Jeremy Kimball, and that definition up here that we've been using is the church is the people of God who have been saved through repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and have been incorporated into his body through baptism with the Holy Spirit. So this has been the running definition that we have used via this definition from Jeremy Kimball. Again, a people of God. They've been saved through repentance and faith in Jesus. They've been incorporated into his body through baptism with the Holy Spirit. So this right now is the definition that we're utilizing for our foundation. Now last week we began to look at the seven communal aspects of what does the church do when it comes together. At the very core and essence of who we are, what is it that we do? And so last week we first started with looking at we assemble in local gatherings to worship. So that's the very first thing that a church does. What a church is, is we are a gathered people. It is a gathering. And when we come together, when we assemble, we come for a singular purpose, and that is to worship God, to worship and to glorify Him. And so now, up here, what we have on the screen, secondly, so that not only does the church assemble in local gatherings to worship, but two, to hear the word preached. So hear the preached word is the second communal aspect that we do. And that is what we're going to focus on this morning, is that we come and we gather not only to worship and glorify God, but we come to hear the preached word. Now, if you've been here for some time with us or in the seven years that I've been here, you would know that there is nothing that I love more to do on a Sunday morning than not only to be with you to assemble and gather to worship, but it's also to preach the word. And so this one this morning, I promise I will not keep us here longer than two hours. Uh, but there's so much here to cover. There is so much here for us to cover that is so foundational. So to begin, a few questions starting out when we think about preaching and coming to hear the word be preached. A first question would be this, what is faithful preaching? What is faithful preaching? Now we all have our ideas, our understanding, just like when we talked about coming together on Sunday. How do we define church? How do we define worship? If someone said worship to you, what would that mean to you? Well, in the same way, when we say faithful preaching, what is faithful preaching? What is it? Another question would be, what do we preach? What is it? What should a church preach? And some of these questions we might think are very easy to answer, but they're not. Because as we see and look to the landscape of church and cultural Christianity over the years, these are not so easy to answer. But what do we preach? Another question would be, and I think is very important, is how do we know what we preach is biblical? Now, one of those things, as we look at that question, I think there's some who might not have any worry or care if it is biblical. And I would hope and pray as we get into this morning that that would bother you and that you're here this morning because you desire for there to be rich, sound, biblical preaching. Not that myself or anybody we're looking for in personality, that they are such a great communicator, but what our aim should be is that they preach the word faithfully, and they preach the word according to the scriptures, and that is what is important. So how do we know what we preach is biblical, what do we preach, and what is faithful preaching? And so we're going to look at today, lay a foundation for this second component not only do we assemble and we gather to worship and glorify God, but we also come and we gather together to hear the word preached. So if you will, let us begin to read 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to read the first five verses here. So this is Paul writing to young Timothy, who is a pastor that he has equipped, that he has trained, and he is sending out to now go pastor and shepherd the church in Ephesus that Paul started. So here's what he tells him in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, 
Verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Then he says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So here we have a second part, a part two, that Paul is giving to young Timothy as he instructs him in the Lord of how he is to pastor, how he is to shepherd, how he is to teach, what the directives, what the actions, what are the main priorities in his ministry as a pastor. Now, first and foremost, for a pastor, the prime ministry for them is to preach the word. There are many other things that a pastor and a shepherd is called to do, but there is nothing more important than to preach the word and also to preach it faithfully. And so here is this charge that young Timothy receives, is that he is to preach the word at all times, in and out of every season. So the very first thing that we see in this text and will carry us as we lay this foundation for preaching is number one is this. We gather to hear the word of God preached. We gather to hear the word of God preached. So not only do we gather to worship and glorify God, but we also gather to hear the word of God preached. It is vitally important that when we come together, the word is preached. Now, the charge given to Timothy by Paul was simple. Three words. Preach the word. Preach the word. Look to somebody next to you and just tell them, preach the word. The word. Now, I want all of you collectively, with all accountability and grit, all of you together look at me and say, preach the word. Preach the word. So, that is our desire on Sunday mornings, is to preach the word. Not Paul's words, not Timothy's words, not their opinions, but to preach the word of God. And that's what we do when we gather. And that should be the aim of every preacher who gets into a pulpit is to preach the word and to preach it faithfully as they had received it from the word. Not Paul's words, not Timothy's words, not their own words or their opinions. This is why preaching can be so dangerous. It can be dangerous for those who hear, and it can be dangerous for the one who proclaims. Because if we don't study the text and study the word, we can say an awful lot that the word is not saying. And there are lots of preachers, there are lots of pastors, lots of people, small churches, large churches, you name it, on TV, not on TV, all of the sort, who are at times not preaching the word, not preaching the gospel, and so what that does is as those of us who hear and receive the word, that must mean we have to be people of the word. So that way we can know we're receiving sound biblical teaching. So we can point out a wolf. So we can point out a false teacher and say, well, that's false doctrine. That's false teaching. That's a false gospel. It's to preach the word. And who would be the recipient of this preaching? Well, it would be the gathered people of God. So he's telling Timothy, preach the word. Who is he preaching it to? To the church that Timothy is going to shepherd, oversee, have authority over, exercise spiritual discipline upon. He's going to do all of it with the word as his primary resource. And so he's telling him to preach the word to the gathered people of God. That's what I love also in our setting, and I'm not saying anything wrong of another setting, but I love in our setting that we have a bright sanctuary. Because I love to see, as much as you might want to hide in a sermon, I love to see the faces of those who I shepherd. I love to see the response, the reaction. At times, it's smiling faces. At times, it's a frowning eyebrow. At times, it might be a little bit of like this. And I love to see all of it because I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor, and I want to make sure that what we are preaching here, that there's something going on within your heart and that you're not being an inactive participant and you're just taking the beating, or you're taking the instruction, or whatever it might be, that you are actively participating with what is being preached. And so, again, for me, I love 
that when we gather, I have the privilege to preach the Word of God with you. Not to you, but with you. It's an active, participating thing that we do together. Because voluntarily, all of you, minus my wife and kids, come here voluntarily. (laughs) And you come to hear the Word preached. It is something we do together. You can't just have someone preaching, but then nobody listening, right? So who is to be the recipient, the gathered people? And what was he to do as he faithfully preached the word? Well, then, just like a good Baptist preacher, he messed up on the last one, but then Paul says, reprove, rebuke, and here's where he messed up because he used an E, not another R. And he said, exhort with the word. He told Timothy, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with the word. Reprove meaning to help come alongside the rough edges of the people and to preach the word. And the way that you do this is through the faithful preaching of the word. And that helps to round out the rough edges of those within the congregation and even yourself as a preacher. Then he also says to rebuke. Now, this is a word that sometimes has been so far thrown out of church life, and we're like, rebuke, that's so harsh, but it's all over the Bible. And what we see here specifically in this text is he says to rebuke them with the word. So not only do you help to rough out the edges, but you also need to rebuke and confront those who are in direct opposition to the word. And it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable for the messenger and the one to receive, but it's for our benefit and for his glory if we allow for the word of God to rebuke us as it does. Then he also says to exhort with the word. This is truly the part of preaching where you encourage and you say, here's the application. Here is how when we go out, let's do this. It's an exhortation, a charge that you're giving. And what does he says? He says to exhort them with the word. It's not to exhort them with excitement or your personality. It's not to exhort them in the words that you use or how you do it or how the preacher is dressed or not dressed or any other thing that we might say. He says simply to exhort and encourage them with the word. Paul even said it about himself as he was somebody writing to a different church, that he didn't use words of flattery. He said he didn't do anything to try to win people over. He said he just simply preached the word. He just simply preached the gospel, and he allowed for the Holy Spirit to be at work. So a question would be, now here at this point, is what does faithful preaching look like in a local church setting? Well, there is a word that we put together here, these two words we put together that I would say is what defines faithful preaching in a local church. It's the words expositional preaching. Expositional preaching. That is what it looks like in a local church setting for there to be faithful preaching, is expositional preaching. So what does that mean? For all of us, this should mean something. We might not know what that means. We might have never heard the word expositional But we need to know it, especially as a church body who is seeking faithfulness in preaching. We need to know that word, expositional preaching. So what is it? Well, up here, there's a definition by a pastor named Mark Dever, who has a church called Capitol Hill Baptist right there in the heart of D.C. And this church, it's an older congregation, been around since, I think, late 17, maybe early early 1800s that this church was established Mark Dever has been there now for over 20 years, established a publishing agency called Nine Marks, and uh, they have a book that is called The Nine Marks of a Healthy Church. And there have been many churches uh, that have utilized this, not as a Bible or the Bible, but have used this as a great tool to say, what are nine marks of a healthy church? Well, the first one that he describes, he says, the first sign of a healthy church is expositional preaching. And here is the definition that is utilized up here. It says, the first mark of a healthy church is expositional preaching. Expositional preaching is the ground on which all other marks of a healthy church take root and flourish by giving the word of God priority. So here's what he's initially just establishing, saying the first sign of a healthy church, the first sign of a healthy church, this mark 
is expositional preaching because then it lays the foundation for everything else. So what is expositional preaching? Preaching in such a way that the point of a particular passage is the point of the message. Preaching in such a way that the point of a particular passage is the point of the message. So the point of the passage is going to be the point of the sermon. Now there's another fancy word that we use for this, and you're going to impress all kinds of people today at lunch. The next word is exegesis. It is E-X-E-G-E-S-I-S. Exegesis. And so exegesis is also this definition. It is determining the main point of a text and letting that be the main point of the sermon. This is our aim in expositional preaching. It's to say the particular context and point of the passage is the point of the sermon. Which means this, the preacher has to start with the scripture first or the idea first? The scripture. It needs to be the scripture first. And so part of it, when we say expositional preaching, it doesn't have to be verses and chapters like we've done the last seven years. Though I would say it's probably the best way to do expositional preaching. But what we are trying to do is to say, we open the word and the text, we study the text first and say, what is the main point of the text? And we exhaustively go through that first and say, this is the main point of the text. And then that becomes the main point of the sermon that we preach. That is expositional preaching. That is what we attempt to do as faithful preachers in a local church setting is to say, The main point of what we've just read here is now going to be the main point of the sermon. This can be done in what we do, book by book, as we're in Mark for a year and a half. And someone could say, Pastor, why are we there for a year and a half? I mean, that's a long time. I even heard a pastor here recently uh, in our area, as I listen to different pastors in our area, I always want to know what other pastors are preaching on. And I heard one say one time about, Uh, that style of expositional preaching that I do, he says, well, I couldn't do that. He's like, because I would just get bored after a while. And for me, I'm just like, well, if you're getting bored of preaching the word, man, (laughs) you might want to do something else. But this idea was, if I'm in one book for a year, two years, I would just get so bored. To me, there's nothing more exciting than for you to know the next text we're going to be in I'm not trying to surprise anybody on a Sunday to say, where's Ricky going to be? Where are we going to be? I mean, a few people here, even in our church, were making fun of me, even on Facebook with memes and things. Where are we going to be? I don't know, probably in Mark. And so again, yes, but that's the thing is I want that to be the case because then you will go ahead of time, do your homework, know the text we're going to be in. You can study the text so that way when we get to it, we can make sure that we're aligned. That, hey, well, Ricky, he's preaching what I read here, and that was the conclusion I had come to myself as well. And then I might expound on some things and give you some extra things that maybe you didn't know through study. But that is our aim, is as we preach faithfully through the Word, my main aim as a preacher is to make sure the main point of my sermon is the main point of the text. We don't start with an idea. We don't start necessarily with a topic we want to go to and say, I want to preach on love, because then what ends up happening is pastors oftentimes will then cherry pick and go to those verses and bring them out of context. And they will try to get one verse in Leviticus, one verse in Deuteronomy, one verse here, one verse there, and they will divorce it from context. They will divorce it from the other passages. And then what they will do is they will make a case based off of one verse that they have divorced completely of its context and say, see, this is what the Bible's saying. I would say more often than not, I would say, well, that's what the pastor or the preacher was saying. Because they're trying to make a point based off of one little verse out of context. As opposed to reading a passage and then saying, here is the passage in front of us. What is the main point of the text? And then we will build a sermon from there. And this will be the main point that then drives home what the word is saying. And so even as I study, I will give you even just a little bit because you could do this in your study. Though you might not have all the resources or knowledge, but for me, one of the first things that I do whenever we're in a study where we're going through books 
is I will go online. I'll go to BibleGateway.com. I will type out the text. I'll go ahead and print it out with cross-references on there. And I have a blank sheet with the verses right there and all the cross-references. And then what I will do is I will spend time highlighting what jumps out to me initially. And then what I'm trying to do is at the very top, I write MPT, which means main point of the text. And I'm trying to spend a full half a day trying to look and say, reading this 30 different times and saying, what is the main point of the text? Then I try to write that out. From there, I say, okay, now I need to support this main point. Okay, now let's look at point one, two, and three. Can I find them? Okay, let's bracket those. All right, do each of these now connect still to the main point of the text? If it connects, I keep them. If it doesn't connect, I do away with it, and I start over again on that point and say, how can I still connect it to the main point of the text? And then what I will do is I break down there, and I give an explanation for every single point I make, and then an application. So I'm going to explain it and then say, this is how we apply this. And I'll do that two, three, four different times depending on where I'm at. And then finally, I conclude with a summary of how can I summarize the main point of the text And then I always do a gospel implication to say, this is how this reflects to the gospel. And then lastly, a final uh, application to say, here we are, here's a final question, what are you going to do with it? If you've been around seven years, I've done that same thing every single Sunday. I have walked through that religiously every single Sunday. Now that I've shared that with you, you might be able to see that in the weeks to come when we get into a book study again. But that's what we are to do, is to say, what is the main point of the text? When you come here on a Sunday and we gather to worship the Lord, when we also come to hear the word be preached, I pray that there never be a day where we don't read the text out loud, where we don't have the Bible in front and say, here is the passage for us today. Because I don't want it to be my voice that you hear I don't want it to be my words or opinions. I don't want it for you to be so convinced in your own mind of something that a conclusion you've come to on your own, but that it would come from the word of God. I have a few verses for us to go ahead and kind of run through here. We'll start if you want to jump back over to the left in 1 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 2. See, rather than going to these verses initially or building a sermon off of one verse, see, now we're going to go back to other verses that support the initial verses we read. So now we're going to go back and use these verses. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 2, it says this, The saying is trustworthy. Anyone aspires to the office of overseer, which is also a pastor or elder, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, and here we have, able to teach. So pastor, overseer, elder, they are interchangeable words we have in the Greek, and this main charge here is they must have the ability to teach. This has nothing to do, again, with personality or charisma or even style or anything else that we might say or even age. But we see at the end of the day, the shepherd must have the ability to teach. Why? Because that is the main function of the pastor in the local gathering and to the people they shepherd is that they instruct them and they preach the word faithfully. We can jump over 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16. In the next chapter, he says, command and teach these things. So here we have the word teach. He says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by the prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. And he says, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. Yet again, he tells them, teach these things. He says that there must be the public reading of Scripture. When do you publicly read this is when the church gathers and assemble to hear the word be preached. He tells them, do not neglect the public reading of the word. Let's jump over to 1 Timothy 5, 17. So the next chapter, he says, let the elders... 
again, interchangeable with overseer or pastor. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And so this is where we have this kind of uh, dichotomy of those that are in ministry, essentially who might be supported by the ministry, and others who might be lay, meaning they have some other vocation like Paul. He was a tent maker, and he was a lay elder, lay pastor. But we see here, he said, let those have the most honor who labor in preaching and teaching. So yet again, the elders, pastors are charged to preach the word. Now let's jump over two letters over to Titus, and we look at Titus 1.9. And Titus 1.9 is such an important verse, so important. I have this verse on a canvas, and I had had it hanging in my office for some time, because for me, I believe this is one of the main tasks, again, of the pastor, elder, shepherd, is not only to preach the word faithfully, but also what Paul tells Titus. Here's what he says in verse 9 of chapter 1. He, meaning the elder pastor shepherd, he must hold firm to the trustworthy words as taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is part of a charge that a pastor, elder, overseer has in a church body is to make sure that sound doctrine is what resides in the church and within the people. So this would include a Sunday school. This would include a children's church. This would include youth group. This would include anything and any time that there is church, that there is time where we are gathering and something is being taught. It is up to the elders of the church to make sure that nobody is in contradiction to the word. And that is a hard task. It is a tall order. But that is part of the ministry of those who preach the word faithfully is to make that sure that it is always preached faithfully at every avenue and street of church life. And he says to rebuke those who contradict it and that you would give instruction and sound doctrine. How do you give instruction and sound doctrine? Well, you preach the word and you preach it faithfully. You preach the main point of the text, and that becomes the main point of your sermon. It is the work of the elder shepherd to preach the word faithfully, to preach the whole counsel of God's word, despite cultural pressures from within and outside of the church. See, this is a blessing. What those don't realize, that pastor who made the comment that he would get bored if he preached in the same book for two years, what he doesn't understand truly an expositional preaching, is every Sunday, it's a new topic. When we were in the Gospel of Mark, every Sunday was a different topic. It wasn't the same topic. Though we have the same person, always the same person, which is Christ, and he should be the main point of every sermon that we get to. But what we see is that every single text, every verse, every chapter, it's different topics. So even expositional preaching and the way that we do it in books and verses and chapters at a time, it is topical. It's just thinking about it in a different way. But when you walk through books and verses and chapters at a time, what it forces the preacher to do and what it forces the hearers to do is we have to wrestle with hard scriptures. We can't keep going back to the ones that we like. We can't keep going back to the ones that are easy. We can't keep going to the ones that might be our pet topics and say, well, I like preaching on grace. Well, I like preaching on love. Well, I like preaching on culture and whatever's going on there and to be relevant. I'm trying to do this and to do that. No, because then you end up just staying there all time and you just play the same song over and over again. And the people that you preach to never mature in the word because you keep giving a steady diet of just the same thing over and over again. But if we start here with the scripture, knowing that it is alive and powerful as Hebrews tells us, then every time we come together and we start with what is the main point of the passage, and that will be the main point of my sermon, knowing that when it's preached, the Holy Spirit will be at work and he will transform us from the inside out as we come and as we gather to listen to the word be preached faithfully. John Trapp, a church father, 1800s, he wrote a complete commentary on the whole Bible. And this is what he says about preaching. 
Up here he says, it is weakness to be hot and a cold matter, but worse to be cold and a hot matter. Culturally speaking, there will always be pressures for the church. We're in it right now, whether you realize it or not. I realize it. I understand it. We are always having cultural pressures from outside the church and from within. There will always be those outside the church trying to pressure the church to change herself that she might be more readily appetizing to the outside world. And what ends up happening is we change ourselves so much we lose our identity and the very ones who tell us to change never show up anyways. And so all of a sudden now we've changed everything for those who would never show up just to appease someone. But then other times it's harder because then it comes from within. Sometimes there are those within who bring up these cultural pressures and things and say, we have to do this. We have to change. We have to update with the times. This is old. This is old school. I mean, I've had so many people tell me that even early on when I was in the ministry, 29, 30 years old, calling me old school. I'm like, I'm 29. I wear vans when I preach. I've grown up in California almost my whole life, and nobody has ever called me old school. But if old school means preaching the word faithfully, I will gladly be old school all day long even when we have cultural pressure within the church, what we do is we say, well, what does the word say? What does the word say? And let's spend time together to get to the main point of the passage. And if the main point of the passage lines up with what you're saying, okay. But if the main point of the passage doesn't line up with what you're saying, then we're in an unfair battle here because we're not going to entertain cultural things based off of culture. If it's within the church, we're going to establish it by the word of God because the pastor, he preaches the word. The people are to be students of the word. We're to be shaped by the word. We're to be transformed by the word. We are to worship and glorify the words of scripture as we sing them. We do all of, the, all of these things around and centered upon the word of God. Not necessarily what we feel or what has happening in culture. Because here, as John Trapp says, it is weakness to be hot in a cold matter. So this is to get so hot in something that doesn't mean anything but worse to be cold in a hot matter, meaning right now in the situation we find ourselves culturally, we are in a hot matter. And for a preacher to be cold right now, he needs to resign his position and to allow for someone else to come in and preach the word. Because that has always been the instruction given to the preacher, is to preach the word faithfully. We are called to regularly sit under the faithful preaching of the word of God for our good and for his glory. Point number two. I told you we're in for a long one today. (laughs) Looking at my time here. Secondly, we gather to receive the word of God as a family. Bringing this aspect of it together. We gather to receive the word of God as a family. So we gather to hear it for ourselves, but we also gather together that we might hear it as a family. Paul exhorted Timothy by saying this. It was up here. He said, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So the warning and consequence is due to a lack of faithfulness in preaching God's word. That people and possibly whole churches will jump off the deep end into false doctrine and false teaching. This is what he is charging here to Timothy. He's saying, be prepared. A time is coming. Can I tell you, the time has already come. It's already happened for 2,000 years. And it will continue to increase until the day the Lord returns. And he says what the people will do. So who is it that is coming to gather to hear these words? Well, isn't it the people of God? Isn't it the church? Isn't Paul talking to Timothy, a pastor? So he's saying there's coming a day where the people 
are going to gather teachers for themselves, accumulate them, that they might go ahead and itch their ears, preach and teach the things they want to hear rather than what the Word of God says. And that is happening all over our world. It's not just happening in the United States. It's happening globally. It's happening everywhere. It's happening in our own community. It's happening in our own city. It's happening in the churches here in Suffolk. What we see here is he's saying there will be those who will throw away sound teaching and instead rather will gather people who will tickle their ears and say the things they want to hear so they might feel good about themselves, so they can walk away unchanged, living the same way they've always lived, and just keep going about it and saying, well, they're continuing to tickle the right spot. He's saying, a time is coming, Timothy. What happens is when the family comes together, we need to make sure that we're receiving a proper diet. The proper diet is the Word of God. And when we come together, we receive it together as a family. When we come together every week, we are affirming the faithful preaching and teaching of those who administer the ministry of the Word. And we do this corporately. And when we receive it in united fashion, the Lord blesses His family and the local church. So what we see happening when we gather together every single week, when we come together, what you are saying by your participation is this. Together we agree with what is being preached. Because if you didn't, you would show the response with your feet. And you would not be here and you would go somewhere else. But what we do every week when we come together collectively as members who are in covenant together, who come to assemble and to worship and glorify God as we come to hear the word be preached. And together, we are those who make sure that that is happening. That's why I had you look at me and say that charge together, preach the word. As we assemble, as we gather each week, as a family, as we readily receive the words of Scripture on a Sunday, we are saying in our attendance, yes, I believe. Yes, I agree. Yes, I affirm. Yes, yes, the Word of God. Yes, that is what we want and desire. And we do this together. Up here, Colin Hansen, just after the COVID pandemic started, he wrote a book called Rediscover Church. And we had a few copies out. Some of you took them. They were, it was a free book. And so it was talking about once we start coming together again, it was basically this encouragement of we need to get back together. And here's one thing they wrote up here on the screen. It says this, we get up and gather with the church weekly because that's where we hear from the divine king his good news, and his counsel for our lives. We hear from him every time we open our Bibles, yes, but we hear from him together in the weekly gathering. We're shaped together as a people there. This is why preaching and teaching are central to our church gatherings. And so it is that when we come together, we are being shaped together in the Word. And we can see that we are of like mind. This doesn't mean that every single person has to agree on every little detail of Scripture because that wouldn't happen. Some of us here, again, we preached a while back and we were in Mark's Gospel and we were talking about the rapture. And as I said, you know, where I've kind of throughout the years kind of gone here and here and here, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib and all of that, that's one of those doctrines that really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. But there are those core doctrines that must be true and unifying for all of us. So when studying the rapture, the most important thing is that Christ is going to come. Now whether he comes one time secretly and then another time, or whether he comes before, middle, or after tribulation, who cares? But we do understand and realize he is coming. And if somebody's not preaching that, then we need to run far away from them. And so when we come together, we are being shaped together by the Word. In our church covenant, it states concerning our commitment to the church. I believe it's the fourth article in our covenant, which our covenant is modeled after the New Hampshire Confession of Faith of 1853. Some of us, maybe you never even knew that. I discovered that about three years ago. When I was looking at our bylaws and our constitution, and I was reading the Word, and I was like, you know, this sounds a little... 
not different in a bad way, but I said, it just sounds a little different. So then I typed up the first thing, the first few words, and then all of a sudden pulled up the New Hampshire Baptist Confession. I said, well, let me see if it lines up with everything else. Sure enough, word for word, it was the Baptist Faith of Confession of 1853 in New Hampshire. And it had a church covenant. And lo and behold, our church covenant says the very same thing it said in the New Hampshire Baptist Confession of Faith of 1853. Now that is a good thing because it's longstanding and it hasn't changed since the 1850s. But we see that in our covenant, it says this up here. It says, part of our agreement as a church member is to promote its prosperity, to sustain its worship, to sustain ordinances, to sustain discipline, and to sustain its doctrine. Doctrine is a fancy word of teaching. So what happens is when we join ourselves and become a member of a church, we are conforming ourselves, if not simply affirming what it is the church as a whole believes, rather than trying to spend much effort to change what the church has already believed based off of a person or a group or whoever. What we see is when we come together, we are protecting what has always been at the inception. We've always had this church covenant. We've always had this doctrinal statement. We've had it since the early 70s when all those things were put together. It has been there at our inception. And so what we do as members and as preachers is to uphold the doctrine rather than trying to change it at every turn and every corner because of something culturally or somebody doesn't like something, we continue to uphold its doctrine. What unites us as a family is Christ himself and the doctrinal position that have been held since the inception. About cultural positions, when we think about those things, and people press us, and they press it upon the church, and they say, we have to change this. The question I have for us, is it God's word who has changed, or is it the ever-changing culture that has changed? You see that battle there, ever-changing culture, meaning it continuously for eternal will change? Has that changed or has the word of God changed? I think it's the ever-changing culture that has changed. And anybody who builds a preaching ministry upon the ever-changing culture of life is going to find very quickly that they are in quicksand. We are called to be students of the word of God so that we might balance what we hear with what is written and find continuity as a body of believers. What my prayer and aim is, is when you leave this place, that you confirm that what we preached here was sound and it was in Scripture. That you go back and you look at all those other verses that we say, here's 1 Timothy, we don't have time for Psalms, here's this, here's that, to write those down so that way you can go back later in the week and that you might go ahead and look them up. A reason we have a bulletin, in there you can take notes. Also, we have those study questions there, questions to go a little further with the message to say, okay, let me look at those sometime later on Wednesday, Thursday. I'm going to go through those questions and see and continue to wrestle with the sermon. We do all of these things so that way we make sure together that we have a resounding amen to what is being preached. Lastly, what then charges us forward together in all of this is we gather to put into practice what we have heard from God's word. So this is the application point. We gather to put into practice what we have heard from God's word. So not only do we gather to hear it be preached, then also we gather to receive the word of God as a family, but then as we hear it as a family, we gather to put it into practice what we have heard from his word. So when we come together and we gather, it is vital for us to come prepared to receive from God's word with the posture to submit to the word in order for it to transform us. Just like when we go anywhere else, the majority of us, we come prepared. You know, at times when we start school, and I know some of us here, we're we're starting school up and we're just not, not ready for it. But when they pass out the syllabus, I remember the first day of school, I dreaded every first day of class because they gave you that syllabus, and they told you what's coming. You're like, I have how many tests? I have how many quizzes? Like, I have to read how many books? 
I have how many activities, how many essays I have to write, how many, and you come in there, and, but it's to mentally prepare. They do this to mentally prepare you and also to cause you some anxiety. <laughs> so they have that over you as a teacher. But they're trying to prepare you, right? So you come into knowing what it is that you're getting yourself into. Well, can I say that when we come together on Sunday mornings, it's no different. There is this saying out there, as I mentioned last week. Last week, we, we talked about sayings Paul never would have understood or heard. Church shopping, church hopping. Paul would have been like, what? Another one that gets thrown out there all the time is, well, I'm, I'm not getting fed. Can I just say that's just another Christianese word we've created that's not necessarily in the Bible, though from Paul, yes, he tells Timothy, preach the word. So yes, we want the word to be faithfully preached. But to another degree, sometimes when we say preaching the word, it was not being fed. We're like, I just didn't get anything from it. Like, I don't know if it's them. I don't know if it's me. I just don't know what it is. I just couldn't get anything. Can I just say that in the years I've preached, in the years that I've been under preaching, Yes, at times, that will have to do with the preacher themselves. Their private life, their private prayer, the way they handle their family, things of that nature. It, at times, it comes out in the pulpit if the minister truly is not a person of God and worthy to follow as an example. It comes out. I'm not saying to look for anything perfect because I will fail at that greatly. I am not perfect. But what happens when we say this notion of being fed, oftentimes the burden is upon ourselves as the hearers because we didn't come prepared. I mean, even if someone preaches five minutes and that's it and we're done, the mature believers should be able to say, I got something from that. You know what? I got an action. I got something to pray about. Oh, that verse reminded me of this. We should be able to do that because if we're coming into a place prepared and we know what's coming, we know it's going to be expected. We know, as I already shared with you, how I preach in my outline. So, okay, Ricky's on point one. Now he's explaining. Next is application. Okay, now he's going to go to point two. Now we did this. Okay, he said, here's the summary. Oh, he said for the third time, here's my last thing I'm going to say. <laughs> You're going through all of these things. But part of it should be, before we even come in here and sit down, we should already be praying on the way, Lord, it's been a rough week, but I pray I just hear from your word this morning. Not from Ricky, not from a Sunday school teacher, not from anybody else, but to say, I just pray I just received something from your word today. And I can guarantee you, if we come with that hunger, we're not going to want to miss a Sunday. Not because of me, not because of anyone else who might teach here, but because God's word is continuing to draw us out and we're getting so hungry and it's like he only let us have one bite and we wanted like three more. And God's like, no, 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 no. One bite today, you get the next bite next week. If we come with that hunger and anticipation, we pray, Lord, let me just hear from your word. And if we study and we journal and we take notes and we look through the questions and we have our Bible and we're highlighting, I can tell you that's going to drastically change your attitude, perspective, and what God does in your life as you come each week. It will not be a chore, but it's going to be such a rich privilege that we get to gather and worship and glorify and hear the word preached. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says this up here. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. What equips for every good work? Go back to the very first part. All Scripture is breathed out by God. Profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, and training. And by having the word be preached, it helps to equip us for every good work. 
This is why the Word of God and preaching is a central component of our training and equipping to be developed into the likeness of Christ. We do this together by hearing the same message every Sunday. That's why it's a blessing to be here each week so that way we can hear the same message so when we go out, we know how to hold ourselves accountable and one another because then we can say to each other, didn't you hear the message from last week? Usually when we say that to somebody, sometimes the connotation is that person's not acting that way, right? Didn't you hear it? You know, I'm not saying it ever happens in a household or on the way back in the car going home. That's never happened in any of our marriages here at our church or families, never ever. But sometimes it's like, didn't you hear the message last week? This is why we come together. So we hear the same message. We get on the same wavelength as a church body. And we're all hearing the same message be preached faithfully from the word. James 1.22 says this, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So he's saying there can be a deception in hearing only and not doing the word. So imagine this. Paul tells Timothy, there's coming a time where people are going to gather for themselves, people to teach them to tickle their ears, to satisfy what it is they want to hear. And here James is saying there is a danger in hearing only and not doing what the word actually says. So if you're in a church that is only giving you what you want to hear, then what do you end up doing is the very thing possibly that the word is not telling you to do. This is why it's so important for expositional preaching to be in the church. This is why it's so important for the main point of the passage to be the main point of the sermon every single week. This is why it's so important for us to open the word of God together to hear it as a family so that way we don't just get a head knowledge and get so smart and know all of this stuff And now we go to lunch, and we can use the word exegesis and expositional. And the waitress is so just impressed with your language. Where did you get that from? At church. No, we don't want head knowledge alone. But for it to be spirit-filled and an empowered time, resulting in a transformative work of the Holy Spirit in us. Every time we gather and the word is preached, the end goal is that you leave this place changed and transformed, working on something, an action step to move forward with. That is at the heart also for me, one of my objectives in preaching is not to preach again to an inactive people, but preach to an active people to say, this is what the word requires of us. Now let me excite you and charge you to go do it. That is always part of the aim in preaching. And we are called to first hold our lives up to the lens of the word and second to our brothers and sisters in Christ with the aim to live by the word and to live out its commands. What we always do is just like a mirror. Every Sunday, every week, every day, we read scripture, we allow for it to be a mirror to us, and we say, is it in us yet? Is this part in me yet? Holy Spirit, let this be true in me, of me. Holy Spirit, rid me of this, of that. Change me, transform me, do a work in me. And we hold it up to the lens of Scripture. And when it is preached faithfully, that's what we do. And also as members and joined to one another, we also hold each other accountable to the same mirror. We look at it first and then we pass it on to the one sitting next to us. And this is what we are called to do. And we do it through the word. He said, reprove with the word, rebuke with the word, exhort with the word. Not only does the preacher do that, but we do that to one another. And we are to do that graciously. As a church, we gather. We are a gathering. We come to worship, glorify God in regular participation in the life of the body. We submit ourselves to the preaching of the word of God and sit under its authority through faithful exposition. We hear it, we receive it, and we put it into practice. That's the rhythm we have as a church. Every Sunday as we gather to hear it preached, we hear it, we receive it, we put it into practice. 
And at the core of all our preaching is the proclamation of Christ crucified, risen, coming again. Present in all our preaching and teaching is the threat of the gospel, and we keep this at the forefront of all church activity and teaching. The first primary thing we always preach is Christ crucified, Christ risen, Christ coming again. That is to always be preached in the life activity of the church at every level and in every component. We preach the gospel. So what is our response? Every week, the word is being preached. And the question is, are you listening? Every week, the word is being preached. The aim is for it to be preached faithfully. I spend hours in a week when we are in a book study For the end goal of, are you listening to the Word of God? I will spend hours reading through commentaries, looking at original languages, parsing out verbs and statements, reading positions and sides on different things, looking to old church fathers, reading the passage 30 times, coming up with the main point of the text, main point of the sermon, a summary, all of the different things I mentioned before, praying through all of this doing all of that week in and week out just so you get a faithful diet of what the passage is actually saying so you can apply it. And the question is this, are you listening to it? Because the health of a church will always have as a measure what it is that they preach and teach. Ask God to give you a hunger for faithful preaching of his word and to also find yourself daily in his word.